Thanks. Okay, welcome back from lunch. Um, people have been talking about how they feel great to be in person and what it means to them after the pandemic is winding down. Uh, for me, it's wearing a button shirt. First time in <laughs> a couple of years. <laughs> Feeling very professional. Okay. Um, so uh, we have a first invited talk by Nikki Lewandowski from the University of Colorado. And she's going to tell us about near term predictions of ocean biogeochemistry in the community earth system model. Thanks, Mike, um, and thanks to the organizers for the invitation um, and for your perseverance so that we can still have this workshop more than two years in the making, I suppose. I'm really excited to be here in person and to see faces in real life. Um, my name is Nikki Lewandowski. I'm from the University of Colorado uh, in Boulder, which is just a short drive away from here. And as Mike said, I'm going to talk to you about ocean biogeochemical prediction in the community or system model, or CESM. And I've made ocean and biogeochemistry big, um, big font in my title here, because I want to emphasize that I'm not just going to show results from CESM, but I also wanted to frame this talk a little bit and provide some context for how ocean biogeochemical prediction um, is a little bit different from some of the other Earth system fields that we're thinking about making predictions of, and also want to be a little bit more um, future looking at the end of the presentation today. So this work, um, many people have contributed to this work. I've listed just some of them on the bottom of the slide, students, postdocs, colleagues, et cetera. So thank you to all of you who have contributed. So why would we want to make a prediction of ocean biogeochemistry? I think if you asked any oceanographer why you would want to do this, they would have pretty much the same answer as anybody else in this room, um, which is that we want to make a near-term prediction that's reliable because it could potentially aid in some, source, some sort of resource management decision-making process, right? And that would be true across any part of the Earth system. Um, the canonical example in ocean biogeochemistry is, of course, the fisheries and fisheries resource management. If we had the ability to make reliable near-term predictions of something that's relevant for fisheries, then there's the potential to manage that fishery a little bit better in the future. But another thing that jumps out at me when I think about why I would like to make an ocean biogeochemical prediction of the near-term future is that our system is really vastly undersampled. Um, we have very few observations of ocean biogeochemistry relative to some of the other components of the Earth system. And so if we had the ability to make a prediction of, let's say, an event that might be persistent or long lasting um, months to years in advance, imagine the sort of field campaign that we might be able to pull together to go out there and actually make a measurement of what's going on out there. Um, and so in a way, you could think about how near-term predictions in this particular field could enable real meaningful scientific discovery. So the example I like to have here is this is the blob. This is a marine heat wave in the north, northeastern Pacific, which showed up and lasted for a long time. If we had known that was coming in advance, imagine what we would have done, right? What we would have, how we would have pulled our resources together to get out there and start to measure things as this blob was evolving and changing. Um, in our group, we have done a number of studies estimating um, the potential predictability of a num number of biochemical variables of interest in the ocean. I'm going to highlight three of those studies today, and we did this all using the CESM Decadal Prediction Large Ensemble, or DPLE, which I think you've already heard about at this conference this morning. Forgive me, I missed this morning because I was teaching, but I think you may have heard that already. Um, the three variables that I want to talk about today are um, marine phytoplankton. Um, these are the single-celled algae that live in the sunlit surface of the ocean, they perform photosynthesis, and they form the, the base of the marine food web. Um, and so there's tremendous interest in thinking about whether or not phytoplankton biomass or abundance or um, production is potentially predictable in advance because this can aid with um, near-term predictions of ecosystem health or a fisheries productivity or, or even a fisheries catch. The second variable I'm going to talk about uh, making near-term predictions of is ocean acidity. Um, ocean acidification is a long-term ongoing environmental problem, um, but interestingly, the ocean acidity isn't just constantly going, the pH isn't just constantly dropping. There's quite a bit of year-to-year -year variability, and there's quite a bit of regional variability. And so having the potential to make a prediction of this quantity in advance 
um, can be beneficial for um, folks who are studying coral reef ecosystems, for folks who are, who are thinking about shellfish fisheries where organisms make shells out of calcium carbonate that could potentially dissolve or be harmed by ocean acidification or ocean acidification event. And so what's shown here is a, a coccolithophore, um, which is a, a, a phytoplankton that builds a calcium carbonate shell and it's grown under normal conditions and here it's being grown under acidified conditions. You can see there's quite a market difference in this coccolithophore. And then the third variable that we've been um, thinking about is the flux of carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the ocean. And one reason why you might want to make an advanced prediction of this quantity is because, um, well, we have, if we want to hit a particular target for atmospheric CO2 concentration, we need to know how much carbon the ocean is going to absorb. And if we know that in advance, then that can help our emissions management strategy. If we even have an emissions management strategy, it could help potentially with that. So this is a, a third study that I'd like to introduce today. Before I introduce the results of those studies, I want to just first highlight some of the unique things about ocean biogeochemical prediction that may or may not happen in other aspects of the Earth system. First and foremost, we have humongous trends, like huge trends that we have to worry about. And these trends manifest even one year into our forecast. And so we have to come up with a way to assess things relative to this enormous trend. So as an example here, I'm showing a time series of the partial pressure of carbon dioxide measured here in the California current, or not measured, but modeled here in the California current system um, from 19, uh, the 1950s through 2020. And the black line is a reconstruction from a model of what that PCO2 is. And you can see it's obviously going up. And that's because as the atmospheric CO2 goes up, the ocean CO2 goes up to, in response, right? Because the ocean absorbs more and more carbon. Um, and then you can see these are just 10 ensemble members from the CESM DPLE, um, initialized in 1960, 1980, and 2000. You can see how much they follow this trend. So one of the things that we do with ocean biogeochemical prediction that you may, may or may not do so much with some of the other Earth system variables is we compare to an uninitialized forecast, and we do this a lot. And that's because the uninitialized forecast has the same external forcing as the initialized forecast. Um, but it has different internal variability. So the uninitialized forecast was initialized so long ago that the initialization has worn off. And it's really important that we do that comparison, that we see if we're doing better when we initialize the model, because otherwise we'll get a really strong correlation coefficient just because they're both trending, right? Um, and that isn't what we want to know. We want to know how the variability is, is being predicted. A second unique aspect of ocean biogeochemical prediction, which I've already said a little bit about, is that we have almost no observations. Um, and I'm not kidding, like very few observations. So on the left, this is the same variable I was showing on the previous slide. This is the surface ocean partial pressure of carbon dioxide. This matters for the CO2 flux. Um, and it's colored in on this map if we went at least once between 1970 and 2021 and made at least one measurement at that spot. Right? And so it looks good, like, wow, we have such good coverage. But when you look at like an individual month over this, this record, like this is January of 1989, that's the total number of data points that we have for surface ocean PCO2. And this is, you know, maybe, maybe we just weren't doing very good in the 80s, but this is 2016, the same month, January. Um, we're, we simply don't have a lot of observations. And so this is another unique aspect of what we do in ocean biogeochemistry prediction research. We don't necessarily assess the skill of our prediction because the observations aren't sufficient to do that yet. Um, and so all of the things I'm gonna talk about today and a lot of the literature focuses on the potential to make a prediction. So we compare the initialized forecasts to um, uh, reconstruction of the ocean biogeochemical fields of interest created with a model because we don't have the real world observations. And so I'll talk at the end about the potential to start to do this moving forward in the future, but for now we are not doing it because this is what we have to deal with. Okay, so the first uh, study that I wanna, I want to uh, draw your attention to is a really nice paper by Kristen Crumhart. Kristen is here, raise your hand. Kristen's back there, there she is. She has a lovely poster outside. Um, Kristen was a graduate student in my research group. And before she left to become a scientist at NCAR, um, she published this really nice paper um, that looked at the potential to make predictions of phytoplankton productivity. And in this particular figure, I'm focused on the large marine ecosystems, the regions off the coast where we tend to do a lot of fishing. And what you're looking at is a map of the anomaly correlation coefficient for the potential to predict phytoplankton productivity in these large marine ecosystems lead year one. So one year after the forecast is initialized, essentially. And so red colors indicate that there's, there's high correlation between the initialized forecast and um, the reconstruction. 
And you can see quite a lot of red colors. There's only one area here um, in the Benguela upwelling region that, that is blue in this case. Um, and the darker the red, the higher the, the potential. So there is real high potential to make predictions of um, net primary production in these important fisheries regions. Um, Kristen is now working on making seasonal to multi-year um, predictions using the same prediction system. If you'd like to learn more about that, it's also on her poster outside. So I'd encourage you to check it out after the session ends. The next study that I want to highlight is about ocean acidification, um, and in particular in the California Current, which is this region um, to the west of California, where the, the, the ecosystem is very vulnerable to ocean acidification. Essentially, it's, it's teetering on the edge of becoming acidified um, if it hasn't already um, for these organisms. And so we're very, very interested in how acidity varies in this region and whether that variation might be predictable in advance. And so this is a paper that um, my former student, Riley Brady, published in 2020, where he investigated the predictability, the potential to predict surface ocean pH in this, in this region. And what you're looking at here is a plot of the mean absolute error in the prediction of pH in this region as a function of forecast lead time using the CESM DPLE. And what you can see is that the initialized forecast, this blue line, has lower error relative, importantly, to the uninitialized forecast, which has the same externally forced trends, um, and also relative to a simple persistence forecast. And so there is, again, the potential to have an improved forecast of ocean acidity in this really important, critically important region for um, marine fisheries and ecosystem health. And then a third study I want to highlight um, is one that I published about um, air sea CO2 flux a couple of years ago. And um, here we looked at whether the initialized version of our model ensemble predicted air CO2 flux variability in advance better than an uninitialized forecast, better than a simple persistence forecast. Um, and, and it did, um, but what I'm showing you here is how many lead years out do you have a benefit from initializing your forecast? And so what I wanna draw your attention to um, are these sort of purple colors at the, at the end of this um, time scale. This suggests that um, in those regions that are colored purple, that we get a gain in predictability that lasts nine or 10 years when we initialize the forecast. And if you're not a carbon cycle person, you're looking at this map like, what the heck do this, does this mean? Um, but these are biomes in the global ocean. Um, and the North Atlantic, the North Pacific, and the Southern Ocean are biomes that are known for taking up a lot of man-made carbon. And so not only is there potential to make prediction, but there's potential for that prediction to have skill multiple years in advance over another type of prediction system in really critical regions where the ocean absorbs carbon from the atmosphere. Um, great, so where are we headed next in ocean biogeochemical prediction? Um, there are a couple of new directions, I think, that I wanted to bring to your attention today. First is that we have many more quote-unquote observations with which to assess skill. So since this workshop was originally planned two years ago, there have been an abundance, a plethora of new observationally based products. People are taking the very sparse data that you saw a map of and gap filling it using all sorts of machine learning approaches and other approaches to estimate what that variable might be where we didn't actually have a measurement of it. And there are a number of issues with doing that, which I'm not going to get into today. But nevertheless, what it means is that we now have these observation based products and we can begin to start to use these products to assess how skillful our predictions are compared to real world observations. So we can go beyond the potential to make a prediction and look at the actual skill. Um, and so these are three examples of products um, that have been published recently and one is actually not out yet. This is an interpolated estimate of the surface ocean partial pressure of CO2. This is one of the surface ocean pH, um, and this is one that's about to come out, which is really cool because it has information about the subsurface, not only the surface, but what's happening below the surface in terms of carbon and some other variables that we're, we're interested in. Um, another new direction for ocean biogeochemical prediction is thinking about the system more holistically such that um, an ecosystem is not just impacted by one stressor. It can be impacted by multiple things at the same time. So take for an example, a marine heat wave, thanks, a marine heat wave that um, also leads to deoxygenation or a change in primary productivity. All three of those things are gonna stress the ecosystem in different ways. And it's important that we start to think about having, um, being able to make predictions of those variables sort of simultaneously um, to think about how, how that might influence the ecosystem um, in terms of prediction space. And so this is an example from a study that 
um, Sam Mogan, who's a grad student in my group, is working on, and he has a really nice poster about this. Also in the lobby out there, I would encourage you to go see it if you haven't already. He's looking at temperature and acidity forecasts in coral reef ecosystems um, in the Pacific Ocean, which are hard to see on this slide, but they're little dashed black lines over there. And then finally, another new direction that um, I've become very intrigued in is the idea that the internal or the chaotic component of the biogeochemical system may change in the future as external forcing changes. And this is a really nice example of what I mean when I say that. So this is a time series of total phytoplankton biomass in the global ocean um, from an ensemble, from the CESM large ensemble. And um, each gray line is an ensemble member, and this is the ensemble mean. And so overall, it's going down. But the other thing that I see when I look at this plot is that the spread in the ensemble is also going down with time. So the internal, the internal component, the chaotic component, is lessening with time. And when you look at where this is happening, if this would actually work, oops, when you look at <laughs> where this is happening, the decrease is happening really strongly in the North Atlantic and the North Pacific where we happen to do most of our fishing. Um, and so this suggests to us that um, the chaotic component of primary productivity, or in this case, phytoplankton biomass, it may be easier to make a prediction at the end of the century than it is right now, simply because there's less internal variability in the system. And so I think this is a new avenue of research for us. So, to summarize, I hope I've convinced you that ocean biogeochemical prediction is emerging and also a very exciting new research field with multiple potential applications and much to be learned. Um, with the CSM, we've done a number of um, analysis projects and they reveal the potential to make predictions of marine phytoplankton, ocean acidification, as well as ocean carbon absorption. And then there are several new future research directions in the subfield of ocean biogeochemistry for prediction, uh, which include you know, the potential to have real world skill assessment using observations, um, thinking about things event-based or from a multi-stressor perspective for the ecosystem, um, and also the possibility of perhaps the, our ability to make predictions will become easier at the end of the century as the internal variability or the chaotic component um, shrinks with climate change. Thanks so much for your attention. Okay, thanks. Yeah, our next talk is by uh, Stephanie or Steph Brody um, from UC Santa Cruz and uh, the NOAA Southwest Fishery Science Center. And she'll be discussing multi-year climate predictions to support fisheries management in a changing ocean. Okay, thanks, Mike, and hi, everyone. Okay, thanks for that introdu introduction. Um, I guess I'm going to give a pretty broad uh, overview of some ecological forecasting applications and where ecological predictability can come from. And this is the idea that this is a very new emerging field um, and it's very much forward looking. And so I just wanted to kind of touch on a few of those applications and think about how we can use the outputs of some of these physical models and biogeochemical models uh, when it comes to ecological forecasting. Okay, so climate change is driving species distributions uh, worldwide, the changing ecosystem function. Um, this is very, very simple schematic of what we're kind of generally seeing across ecosystems worldwide. And what we're seeing in the ocean is that species are shifting faster than in terrestrial domains. And this is creating a lot of challenges for marine managers, uh, marine resource users and ocean governance. That doesn't look too good up there, but uh, this is a paper that came out a few years ago that was looking at uh, the number of transboundary species um, projected out to 2100. So this is the idea that in every EEZ by 2100, there will be at least one new fish stock um, in that EEZ that managers have to worry about. And so this is a, a projection in this figure here, but what we have already seen historically is that there have been already challenges, kind of political challenges and, and governance challenges for these shifting species distributions. The perhaps most famous one is the EU mackerel wars. Um, but here in the Pacific, there's also been the renegotiation of the US and the Canada um, Alpcor Treaty. And this, doesn't, this isn't just limited to fishery stocks. Uh, these shifting distributions also have implications for species of conservation concern. And so these shifting species have resulted in unwanted bycatch. Um, this is just for seabird bycatch um, 
on the screen, but this can extend to a number of different species. Uh, and in, also in whale entanglement and increasing ship strikes as species uh, such as whales uh, increase in their overlap with historical fishing grounds. And I also wanted to highlight uh, the component of variability and the threat that this also poses to ecosystem services. And so this is a, a quick summary figure uh, from a paper that came out last year in science where it re reviewed 34 marine heat wave impacts since 1995 um, and basically considered the, the threats and challenges to ecosystem services from these marine heat waves. And at the moment in the ocean, this kind of impact of climate variability has so far focused on marine heat waves, but that is starting to change as we kind of consider more compound events, um, such as um, what Nikki just mentioned in her, in her talk. And so when it comes to kind of being prepared for this climate variability um, at the ecological and ecosystem level, we really need accurate predictions and we need those predictions across uh, all forecast horizons. Um, and Given the concept of this workshop of being society rel relevant decisions, it's important to consider that decisions change across different uh, timescales. So in this kind of near real time timescales of zero to 10 days out, a uh, fisher might be thinking about using a weather forecast or they might be thinking about um, looking at a hotspot map to figure out where they might wanna go and target a particular species and avoid by bycatch of another species. As we move further out into that uh, forecast horizon, at this kind of seasonal time scale, uh, there might be kind of considerations on when to hire labor um, or to when to kind of harvest from a, an aquaculture facility, for example. And as we move further out to this kind of multi-annual uh, component, there's this consideration of kind of setting spatial management um, or even kind of thinking about stock rebuilding programs. You know, you can't rebuild a stock in a year. You really need to be kind of thinking multiple years ahead of, as to how you can achieve that. And then, of course, at this final time, sca time step of decade or century, this is more kind of a scenario planning exercise as to where we might be headed. OK, so at each of these timescales, uh, forecasting ecology relies on ecology itself being predictable. It's kind of a, a logical argument there. And so this kind of raises the question of where can ecological predictability actually come from? Um, it can com come from life history. Um, so you can kind of think, think of this as like a biological persistence. Uh, if we know what the population size is and we know the, uh, how that population ages, then we know their life history traits, then we can kind of predict uh, the, the mortality of that population and what that population size is at certain lead times. And so this kind of leads uh, to the idea that higher trophic level species, longer lived species and larger species are actually more predictable um, because of those life history traits. We also get predictability from persistence. Um, and this is persistence in the sense that a species in a location um, will be close to that location on, on day two and so on and so forth. Uh, we can get uh, predictability from phenology. I'm thinking along the lines of animal migrations and these migrations can happen annually. From passive advection. And finally, uh, we can get predictability from environmental species responses to environment. And this really comes back to this distribution question uh, in the sense that when we know animals' uh, environmental preferences, we can actually predict what their expected um, and future distribution will be. Okay, so uh, animal movements are a function of multiple scales of environmental variability. Uh, so this is some example um, tracking maps from more highly mobile kind of migratory species in the Pacific. And what we see is this kind of integration of environmental signals in that movement. Um, so we kind of have these cross basin scale migrations um, that might, might be tuning into this kind of historical knowledge of where there is good foraging conditions and where is a safe place to breed. Um, and zooming in right down to those kind of fine scale movements of when an animal is in a specific location, how are they foraging at that fine scale to kind of um, uh, uh, find the food that they need. Uh, and so I kind of wanted to, to hone in on this a little bit more because um, we don't really understand why 
or how these animals are kind of integrating that information over those multiple scales of variability and where we can harness that predictability from. And so I'm going to zoom in on a, a small case study uh, using swordfish in the California current. And in this system, swordfish exhibit these kind of seasonal foraging migrations across the West Coast. They have an annual foraging, a spawning migration um, out to Hawaii. They can return to the exact same site following that migration. And then at any one of these locations, they have this kind of foraging component where they move up and down in the water column to feed um, and tune into certain prey fields. And so given that there is a huge amount of uh, complexity regarding swordfish movements in this area, we have a really, really good ability to predict where swordfish will be. And that's kind of amazing given this complexity. And so I wanted to kind of hone in and say, well, well, what is the actual mechanism? Why can we have this predictability? Where's it coming from? And so this has kind of led me to this question of which temporal scales of environmental variability uh, provide predictability. And so to do this, uh, I did a temporal decomposition of the primary environmental variables that we know drive swordfish distribution. One of those is sea surface temperature. So here we have sea surface temperature daily fields on the left, and that's broken down into a three component parts for an example day. Uh, the monthly climatology, the low frequency and the high frequency components. Um, and here it is again for a, a second day in 2015. And you can see here in the kind of third panel, um, up the top it's blue, down the bottom it's red. And that's generally kind of indicating this low frequency component that um, uh, when, I guess, across the entire domain, it can be either anomalously cool or anomalously warm. And so I kind of wanted to see what is swordfish responding to in this domain? And so I integrated uh, each of those component parts into a species distribution model um, to predict swordfish catch in this area from a local fishery. And what we see is that there generally isn't that much of a difference between these component parts. Uh, red here being uh, showing positive values of swordfish catch, blue being zero catch. And what we see is that because there are very, very minor differences, it's actually the climatology that's driving most of our ability to predict swordfish distribution and swordfish catch. Uh, and that's somewhat logical, I guess, but also surprising um, given most of the kind of research that is telling us to use more kind of dynamic variables and um, challenging our ways that we can kind of predict with this uh, climate variability. And so I wanted to dig into this a little bit further and, and converted those um, swordfish catch to catch anomalies. Um, and this is the idea of wondering whether we can predict when swordfish catch is anomalously high or anomalously low. Um, and this is where it kind of gets interesting because what we're seeing is that the low frequency component is driving all of our ability to predict catch anomalies. Um, the component, that high frequency component really doesn't add much um, predictive skill at all. And so when we kind of think about that for forecasting, that's really interesting because our ocean models don't really have a lot of skill at that fine scale, um, uh, spatial scale, uh, especially that kind of also depends on what earth system model you're using. And so this is really giving us a lot of confidence for these highly mobile species that they're tuning in to these low frequency component um, for their distributions. And that gives us a uh, increasing trust that we can actually predict these distributions or forecast these distributions um, on seasonal scales and hopefully even out to multi-annual scales. Okay, so uh, thinking about different sources of ecological predictability, I also wanted to touch on how we can actually harness these ecological models for creating ecological forecasts. And there's three kind of general broad approaches um, that kind of exist in the literature at the moment. The first is this option A, which is to only use the physical environment. And so that's just to use a, an SST forecast um, to inform uh, your question of interest. Um, so for example, this is used to predict the lobster migrations of the Northeast um, US coast. The option B is to not actually consider any of the physical components and just look at the auto regression or life history traits um, to predict distribution shifts. And then option C is to then couple that ecological model with a physical forecast system. Um, and this is used 
generally around the world, but one example is um, uh, thinking about timing your ranching activities to match up with the timing of your tuna migration. Um, and this last example is, I guess you could probably consider the best approach because it's actually incorporating that climate variability component. You're not just relying on the historical uh, observations. And so I wanted to touch on a few of operational examples that are, are within NOAA to help kind of, um, I guess, kick off the conversation about ecological forecasting and using outputs from physical and biogeochemical models. Uh, so at this seasonal time scale, we have Coral Reef Watch using uh, temperature forecasts to look at coral uh, high risk bleaching events, pathogen forecasts for human health and seafood advisory, um, or advice, I should say, uh, thinking about forecasting harmful algal blooms and forecasting dead zones for uh, watershed management. Um, when we moved to specific fisheries examples, there are already operational tools out there, but they primarily exist on this near real time to uh, seasonal time scale. And so for these kind of first two examples, these, this is thinking about reducing fisheries bycatch. And, and these are near real time tools that kind of predict and tell a, a fisher when we have a, a potential high turtle bycatch hotspot, for example. Um, but this is now kind of being extended. There's now forecasting salmon returns forecasting when catch limits will be met uh, to implement management and forecasting distribution of, uh, of hake. And these are just USD-based uh, examples on this slide. Um, but moving out to, um, to include this kind of multi-annual decadal timescale, I guess this is really the next frontier for ecological forecasting. Um, there are a handful of examples, um, but they are relatively rare. So on the left here, this is a paper that came out two years ago that forecast um, big eye tuna landings four years in advance. And this didn't use a physical forecasting system. This kind of relied on that biological life traits um, to actually predict um, uh, tuna landings. And then moving forward here, this kind of middle and right hand panel are, are relying more on those um, earth system model forecasts and thinking about uh, correlations between chlorophyll A and fisheries landings and predicting fisheries landings three years out. Um, and, it, and I'm going to touch on Kristen's paper again that Nikki just mentioned, uh, looking at forecasting net primary productivity uh, up to three years in advance. And so this is really kind of the next frontier for ecological forecasting is looking at this um, uh, forecast horizon and this time period of interest. Uh, but a lot of it really does rely on having skillful physical variables um, and knowledge of those skillful physical variables um, and how they can be applied to ecology. And then finally, the, uh, the next kind of frontier that I see is this concept of iterative forecasting. And this is the idea that when you make a forecast, um, let's say one week in advance, you then can then get information tomorrow, the next day, the next day, um, and increase your observations to update that forecast. And in the marine world, we don't have that kind of uh, connection between observations. It often takes a, lead time, a lag time of maybe up to a year of when we have observations to when we actually have that on our computer. So I think moving to that longer time forecast time horizon of uh, multi-annual is really giving us, I think, a lot of hope for moving towards this iterative uh, cycle and improving our forecasts that way. Uh, okay, um, I'll just briefly end with um, some brief points about a path forward, uh, mainly kind of fostering a community of researchers engaged in this space. And for this workshop in particular, I think there's kind of some conversations that could be revolved around which physical variables at which lead times are skillful and how can ecologists use that. Um, so I'll end there. Thank you. Yeah, so our uh, next presentation will be given by uh, Billy Sweet um, from uh, NOAA uh, National Ocean Service, and he'll be speaking about high tide flooding and NOAA sea level rise science and services. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, so more or less that title of the talk aligns with what Mike just mentioned. Um, 
focusing pretty much on sea level rise and what does that mean for coastal flood risk as we're addressing it at NOAA uh, with this concept of seasonal annual, maybe multi-annual uh, prediction in mind, um, <clears throat> what we have working for us and uh, where there's room for improvement. Okay, so there's a few questions to answer um, that we're getting from, from folks, practitioners is, you know, when during the season are we flooding most often? And flooding in this case is not rainfall flooding, it's ocean related flooding. It's a little bit more straightforward. It's um, definitely some seasonality to flood patterns as there is in, in sea level. Uh, but that's where a lot of the focus is right now with uh, skill and models. But a lot of the questions really are on annual time steps. With sea level rise, uh, there's really been an increase of high tide flooding, a flooding with some sort of consequence, and budgets are made annually. So even though maybe monthly seasonal seem to be uh, something maybe for preparedness and implementation of spending your capital that you might have set aside, budgets are made annually, and that's sort of the time frame when packets of information are needed to for smart budgeting. Communities are starting to spend more for uh, people pumps. There's a cost associated re with responding to sea level rise related flooding. Um, and so here's just an example of, you know, not only do we need to know mean sea level changes, it's really that variability part, not of ensemble spread variability, but the storms, the tides, the thing that really calls water to move, because that's what's flooding folks. So. Uh, there are some statistical methods I'll talk about, but essentially with the probability distribution as shown due to years of sea level rise relative to some thresholds, again, that means something in these cases, the height thresholds, um, we're starting to flood more often. The probability of the, whether it's minor or major flooding, let's say on the y, uh, X axis here in meters, whether it's 0.6 or two feet or four feet above mean high, high water, average high tide, the probabilities are increasing. So we have a few things working for us, is namely the tide. Um, so shown here uh, would be sort of the variance of daily highest water levels over a, a 19, 20 year period, uh, as well as a ratio. And so the bottom you kind of see from somewhere like Norfolk versus San Diego, where uh, basically if you're going to flood, if you're gonna have a high water in San Diego, it's because you're at a time of a high tide. That's not the case in Norfolk or Annapolis where I live. So you can kind of get a, a sense on the upper right hand side as to if you're blue, the tide's really important. It's gonna control the time typically when you flood. A change in mean sea level will be probably fairly informative and that's when you're likely to flood. The other places, the Gulf has as much of the mid-Atlantic, you flood because of other things, weather. The winds are blowing, Gulf Stream slows down, there, there are other reasons, usually shorter frequency that are causing flooding, though there's still patterns. Uh, so we're developing a product at NOAA that sort of looks at the timing of the tides. And right now it's fairly simplistic. It's looking at when are the full moon perigene tides, when are they likely to occur, and giving just some sort of guidance as to saying, full moon's coming, tides are gonna be high, be on the lookout. Fairly simplistic, but yet it's informative, but we'd like to improve upon that if we do have predictions of mean sea level, for instance, anomaly, uh, at least to saying it's higher than normal, lower than normal, knowing that that normal is changing through time. <clears throat> so here's something in, in sort of in, in prep and in review, a colleague Greg Dusick working with several others in, the, in attendance here with NOAA and NASA collaboration, uh, University of Hawaii as well using a mean sea level anomaly prediction with some sort of climatological understanding of the non-tidal uh, probabilities themselves to better inform uh, what is the likelihood of exceeding these height thresholds due to the timing of the tides, which we know quite well and due to the astronomic uh, characteristics of the sun, moon, earth system uh, and developing kind of warning calendars with likelihoods of exceeding these, these levels. So that's something we're working towards currently. Um, <clears throat> On the annual scale, a little bit different. You know, we don't really have models that are giving us annual guidance. Um, we do multi-decadal guidance, sea level rise uh, scenarios, projections we just put out last month working with an interagency group. There, we're really trying to characterize the changes in the mean. On the annual scale, we're really trying to characterize the, the, the variability part, it's a lot tougher. Uh, so if we do annual counts of these exceedances, the number of days, well, we have a trend. Um, it may be a quadratic, it may be linear, we're also finding um, 
sort of in a multi-regression sense, influences Avenso on both El Nino Southern Oscillation on both the east and west coast. So fairly simplistic multi-regression uh, to give us some guidance if we have from, let's say, the multi-model ensemble telling us what the, what the strength of the ENSO is going to be, we can factor that in and project out plus or minus a, a one sigma to give sort of a range. Uh, and so that's sort of the current state of our high tide outlook. And you can sort of get a sense of that El Nino actually has an effect on both the east and west coast. One's more direct ocean response, the other one's more of a teleconnected wind response on the east coast. Uh, and we know that you're accelerating. So in many of these east and a few west coast locations. And so there is a trend that uh, the signal of noise is quite clear. So we do have um, we do have some deterministic factors working for us, at least to provide information, but we can do better. So right now, this is the status of our sort of seasonal outlook is I would focus on the near term 2021 as a meteorological year. We're giving sort of ranges as to what to expect if there is no uh, trend, then it's more climatology, which would be the case in a few of the West Coast areas that just haven't exceeded these height thresholds. Um, the multi decadal projections are really pushed by our sea level rise scenario, so I won't um, give much attention to the 2030, 2050 at this point. But uh, we do understand that with El Nino, here's just an example of the probability distributions during some stronger El Nino, stronger La Nina, and the neutral. Uh, there's obviously a very noticeable shift in the mean. Uh, in a two parameter distribution, there is some change in the variance. Um, I haven't really uh, illuminated that the variance part, but more or less it's a uh, sort of an El Nino driven response in the East Coast and in both El Nino, La Nina on the West Coast. So if we wanted to tackle this problem with a probability distribution, um, we would need some additional guidance as to what you know what the future mean sea level anomaly is predicted to be and or better uh, guidance as to uh, climate modes that we've sort of distinguished and deciphered around. Uh, the globe, uh, and we will do this using a um, working off of some work that Melissa Menendez and Fernando Mendez have done these time dependent statistical models that look at uh, a location parameter that would change through time due to seasonality um, tide uh, cycles, such as the nodal or perigene cycle um, trends that are inherent as well as uh, covariate. Co-varying with, let's say, if you train the model on ENSO or North Atlantic oscillation or mean sea level anomaly. A little bit incestuous there. The mean, the extremes change into together, but they're very closely related, but not directly one to one. Um, so this is sort of the statistical lid that we would apply to a prediction of mean sea level. Um, and so working with a military uh, contract. We've sort of diagnosed um, some other researchers have had sort of done similar as to what is the footprint of these major climate indices around the globe to get a sense of if we were going to get predictions of these indices. Um, right now, El Nino, La Nina seem to be the primary one ONI that is being uh, the, the ensembles are for, uh, focused on. If we could get these other ones predicted, then we would at least have a better sense of at least applying these to our statistical models to provide probabilities of exceeding these heights, minor, moderate, major flooding. Um, so here would be an example looking at a 50 year return level or 2% annual chance. In this case, that's somewhat arbitrary. We're talking about areas that might be flooding several times a year, but you could really sort of have the probability distribution down from 10 events per year out to the 1% annual chance showing how this nodal cycle would be changing through time historically, some of which we can project out seasonal cycle, the, the tide cycles themselves, uh, as well as the trend, and then needing guidance of what's shown there, CL, sort of the climate index. For La, uh, La Jolla, it'd be the ONI. For Galveston, a, a flavor of, of ENSO best. Um, anyhow, so to be further explored, um, that's our next step. So. In essence, the way that we've most been approaching it thus far is what is the mean state likely to be? But in, in essence, what we need is heights above some threshold that really means something for decision makers. How many days am I going to have water in the streets, Miami, Norfolk, Charleston? Uh, and this is at least sort of a hybrid approach that we're uh, excited to, to uh, approach and work with many of you in this uh, audience. So thank you. So questions from the audience? Uh, 
Thanks, everybody. Those are three fantastic talks. Uh, this question's for Nikki, although I think Stephanie might have partially answered it, but I'm curious about the source of predictability for those, um, you know, the out to one year predictions along the coast that you showed from that paper. From Kristen's paper? Yes. Um, she'll tell you about it on her poster, but um, generally speaking, we found that the nutrient limited regions are the ones that have the most predictability. Um, and that has to do with the fact that um, advanced knowledge of nutrient advection from the ocean circulation is enabling that predictability. Um, so light limited regions tend to have much less predictability, for example, in high latitude regions. Um, and so if if that any of those coastal regions were in nutrient limited, many of them are upwelling dominated where the upwelling is the supply of nutrients for the ecosystem. Um, advanced prediction of that nutrient upwelling is enabling that predictability essentially. So I have a, a question for, for Billy. Um, clearly there's the strong insole cycle on the West Coast, but um, I don't know if you've looked at the processes that influence the, the tides on the East Coast with insole. Um, so, so the question was uh, processes affecting the, the East Coast. So from the work that I've done and a few others, uh, it really looks to be that it's sort of changing some of the Atmospheric pressure over eastern Canada that's changing some of the prevailing winds, as well as the, uh, I guess, being a more zonal um, jet stream, tend to have more of a coastally oriented storm track. So we do see differences in, in storm counts if we look in terms of the non tidal responses that we would get during stronger El Nino versus neutral or La Nina. So it definitely seems like it's a wind related phenomena that does have some circulatory perhaps some interaction with the Gulf Stream, but it seems like it's stemming from some uh, centers of action that seem to be over the Eastern Can Canadian uh, region, at least from, from work that I've done, Phil Thompson. There's also some earlier uh, atmospheric research done in the, the 2000s. Can I ask a question? I'm gonna ask a question for the other two speakers in my session. Um, so, okay, so one thing that I saw in, um, William's talk that struck me was the, the map with all the different dots showing which climate oscillation, like if you could predict that climate oscillation, where would you benefit the most from that information for your particular variable of interest? But I'm now wondering if, that, if we could apply that to marine ecological forecasting and coastal regions too, like would the map look the same? Because some of those indices had different time scales of variability, like the AO has a different time scale of variability than the NP or whatever, right? So, and you were talking about time scales. Anyway, I'm trying to make a connection between the two talks that came after mine. Whoever wants to come up here. Yeah, that's my turn. Oh, that's kind of like an easy question to a complex answer. Yeah. Um, I think there are a number of studies out there that do find correlations between an ecological metric and these um, broader signals, like the PDO, um, and so that there are correlations out there, but not so much um, mechanistic link as to as to what that could be. So, but it, but it would depend on what the species is and what the metric is. So, that's not a very helpful answer, I don't think. Um, but no, I'm not entirely sure if I don't think that map would exactly align um, between Williams' map and the ecological map. Well, yeah, it's it's an interesting thought, and I know if this extreme value model, it's really looking more at the storm tide. There would be some aspects of the mean that would be characterized by the indice, but I, I think it would be interesting to kind of disentangle whether it's the higher variability response that is being correlated and or how well is that being uh, expressed as well in terms of sort of the, the mean directly itself, not inherent to a extreme value statistical model. So. I think there's relation, but definitely areas to dig deeper. So I think we have a question from Bill Merrifield online. Hi, uh, yeah, um, yeah, for uh, Billy. Um, uh, so in terms of, uh, I mean, if the um, peak to peak in, in variations on both coasts, I believe are in the tens of centimeters. And so, you know, if you look at sort of global mean sea level rise as you know, around four millimeters a, a year these days. I just wonder if it's uh, 
useful to um, sort of describe that interannual variability in terms of several decades of mean sea level rise when communicating the utility of these forecasts to users and policymakers? Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Um, right, in any given year, that variability will affect flood risk, and that oftentimes is not conveyed at the decadal scale. So that is something I think Thomas, I was talking with earlier, which the paper looking at is when we extract variability sometimes to make better trajectories of where's the trend sort of heading uh, in a slightly different topic. But, you know, what is that year to year uh, variability response in a location so that if you would combine that with, let's say, a 2030 or 2040 projection, which we might have somewhat say greater confidence of the models and the observations are aligning, then how might that affect sort of an instantaneous flood risk uh, computation on an annual scale? So th that variability is, is very important. Uh, and so good question. I, I hope I answered that, but it, it's the combination of the two. And now inches matter more than any. So it's not just the mean, it's that variability in a given year that really will stack up and cause greater flood risk. Yeah, I guess another way of looking at it as a strong El Nino year on the West Coast could sort of give you a preview of 2040 or 2050, something like that. Thank you. I have a question to Steph and Nikki. Uh, so there's a uh, uh, international decade program, the UN decade, uh, Ocean Decade for sustainable development 2021 to 2030. I wonder whether ecology prediction, ecosystem prediction is one of the kind of the concept or program submitted to that uh, program uh, for endorsement. Yeah, it's uh, one of their goals. I um, don't even know if it's officially called a goal one of their terms is, you know, a, a predictable ocean. Right. And I think that really just kind of comes in under that banner um, in terms of a predictable ocean from the physics right through to the ecosystem level. And so I think forecasting is an integral component of that, um, but I'm not entirely sure if that's explicitly um, spelt out in, in that regard. Does that right. answer your question? Uh, I, I think it kind of does in, under that theme, but uh, I did not phrase my Question correctly. I was wondering whether there has been community white papers or submission to the national academies to contribute to the UN decade predict the ocean theme for ecosystem. It's a good idea. Maybe we should write one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. So maybe I'll, I'll ask one last one. Um, so it seems that both for the, the biogeochemistry and fisheries, there's really, we're up against trying to see what observations are. Are there, I mean, Nikki, you mentioned kind of statistical advanced methods for filling in. How about from observations point of view, are there things out there that could help fill in the gap? Yeah, definitely. So the new biogeochemically instrumented Argo floats, the um, GBC, or BGC Argo program or the Go BGC, I can't remember all the different acronyms, but um, you know, the idea that we can measure things in the subsurface and the surface uh, um, many more places and at many more times than we ever could before. Um, and we're starting to instrument the whole ocean with these sorts of um, sensors that can tell us not only the temperature and the salinity, but also the nitrate concentration and the pH of the water and the oxygen concentration, um, among other things. Um, they can even tell you something about phytoplankton from or plankton from backscattering. Um, so we're going to have a lot more information in the near future about not only the surface, but also the interior of the ocean that we'll be able to use. Um, it'll be sort of like a new era for biogeochemistry that it'll look a lot like the um, Argo era from the physical oceanographic point of view. But now we have new goals, right, which is to make forecasts and um, things like that. So, yes, new things are coming online and there's there's hope for the future. So this is, uh, I have a question for Nikki. So you mentioned the possibility of compound events. 
Um, and so are there like uh, mechanistic uh, mechanistic connections between uh, like a marine heat wave or a, uh, episode of uh, you know high acidity or low acidity or so um, yeah so is there a kind of a conceptual framework to understand how they can happen together yeah I think so I think we're just starting to get there um, observing things like um, or re reanalyzing things like the blob or the marine heat wave in the in the northeast Atlantic um, there there are connections when the ocean warms it affects the stratification of the ocean, which can affect the nutrient supply. It can also affect the amount of carbon that comes up, which can affect the acidity of the water. Um, it can also affect the amount of oxygen that degasses into the atmosphere or is absorbed by the ocean, and so it can affect the oxygen content. And these things are linked to one another. Um, and so the idea of predicting them simultaneously isn't that isn't that far of a of a reach, in my opinion. Yeah, thanks. And I think we have uh, one last question online. And we'll wrap up. Diane? Um, my question is for Nikki. I wonder whether the ocean BGC uh, processes um, impact the air sea coupling, the ocean atmosphere fluxes, and because uh, there is this uh, um, US Clivar ocean, uh, uh, ocean flood, air sea uh, observation uh, uh, group, new groups. And I wonder whether these um, new efforts, viewed effort, can help understanding these um, um, uh, ocean BGC uh, uh, role in air sea interaction. Yeah, I think definitely that there is a connection. I think, well, my understanding of that of that working group is that it's mostly um, heat and freshwater fluxes, and not so much like gas fluxes. But uh, I could be completely misrepresenting that in my mind. Um, that being said, there. The biogeochemical prediction in the ocean, um, for example, if we, if we have the capability to predict air to sea carbon flux, the reason we have that capability is because we have a model that's evolving both the atmosphere and the ocean at the same time. Um, many of the forecast systems, with the exception of one that I've looked at, has um, they have prescribed atmospheric CO2 for their historical uh, their historical simulations, their reforecasts or their hindcasts, as they're called in in, in um, this community. Um, and so that makes it hard for us to gauge whether the true flux is predictable, um, given that we have prescribed the upper boundary condition for that flux. So I think we would need to do more to know if the flux is truly predictable in a fully coupled system where the atmosphere responds to an outgassing from the ocean um, and the atmosphere responds to an ingassing from the ocean and, and vice versa, rather than having a prescribed boundary condition for, for these sorts of things. Thanks, Ayan. Okay, thank you. Let's thank the speakers again. Great talk. Okay, we'll uh, time for a break and we'll reconvene at 3.15 in the breakout sessions. <laughs>